our reporting and, th- and, and through the news, like obviously Cross River has seen uh, tremendous growth since its inception in 2008. Um, can you share a bit about Cross River today um, and maybe the evolution of, of how you got to where you are today? Sure, be happy to. First of all, uh, great to see you and uh, very excited to be part of this panel um, or, or chat. Yeah. And, uh, I've uh, dropped into a few sessions up until now. It's been great. Super engaging. Been getting a lot of uh, notes from people in the in the audience or potentially who are in the audience, asking questions ahead of time. Oh, so great! Looking forward to the interaction. Sure, weave those into your talk. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so you ask about Cross River. So, I think we are a unique story, and and a super interesting one. So, Cross River is a bank uh, at a fundamental level. Mm-hmm. And we were formed in 2008 as a bank, as a community bank. And what's uh, part of what's interesting about that is that we were the last de novo charter for many, many years. We were formed in the depths of the financial crisis. So it's one of those stories where, you know, you, it's a baptism by fire. <laughs> and you re- really learn how to do things in a much more differentiated way when you're doing them in a, in a period of disruption. So... Rewinding back to where the world was in 2008, Cross River and its management team realized that a banking and financial services absolutely could not be approached in the same way that it had in the past. The regulations were changing, consumer perceptions were changing, tolerance of risk was changing, the delivery of financial services was changing, who could hold them and who could deliver them was changing as well. Take mortgages, for example, that used to be like the a cornerstone of business for for banks. And today you've got non-bank lenders and fintechs, um, you know, such as um, Rocket, who are powering that innovation. So we were born during the foundation, during the fundamental moments when fintech in some sense was coming to life. And we always knew that we would be approaching the delivery of services in in a differentiated way. So interestingly, we've, we've always been committed to tech and we've always been committed to providing the best in class solution. We actually changed our core banking platform even before we all opened our doors for the first time. Really? So we were accelerating our technical capabilities even before we started business. And that was back in, in 2008, 2009. We were profitable in five quarters, which is unheard of for most companies, uh, especially for a bank. And that too, during the financial crisis, we, we, we first saw the evolution of FinTech with Green Sky. So Green Sky was one of our early clients and we sort of helped in some sense shape uh, that initial business model for Green Sky. So GreenSky today works with a number of different banks, or at least prior to Marcus buying them, they worked with a number of different banks. But if you rewind back to where they were before that, they actually worked with us. And we were back then a small uh, capital provider to them. And there was only so much that they could scale with us. So, but we saw the potential in what could happen with FinTech in that, in the delivery of, consumer solutions and business solutions that will be differentiated in the future. And that's what really lit the spot for us back in about 2010. And since then, we've continued this trajectory of orienting the the firm towards growing the FinTech ecosystem. And then eventually, when once FinTech becomes normalized and just becomes everyday uh, financial services, delivering embedded finance and delivering atomic finance at, at uh, a fundamental level across the, across the economy. So that's what really what we are. We want to be that infrastructure provider, and we continue to demonstrate that we are that infrastructure provider that's providing those financial solutions across the economy. I, I appreciate that. There are a few details in there that I wasn't aware of. So um, I already learned something from you, Karen. Um, how did Cross River develop this ecosystem of partners? And I, I guess the other way of asking that question is what makes your offerings unique and capabilities unique? Yeah. Um, so I think if you if you were to walk into, into Cross River today, we're a medium-sized organization 
call it 600 or so people. So we're not small, but we're not huge. Um, we have two big locations, New York and Jerusalem. We've got over 100 developers in Jerusalem. Uh, we are relatively mature, being 14 years in the business or thereabouts, and really growing with the fintech ecosystem and, and powering a lot of some of the biggest names in, in fintech. So we have a fairly large suite of products and services. And so we're not just a single point solution. And we have built a Home Depot of sorts, right? We wanna be the Home Depot of FinTech. If you are starting a FinTech tomorrow and you wanna lend or you wanna be in payments, give us a call. Because we have the pipes, we have the plumbing, we have that infrastructure that can make that a reality. That's really the core mission of what the firm is trying to do. And that's what makes us somewhat unique. We take a somewhat differentiated view that we don't necessarily are seeking to be the end consumer. What we're seeking to do is make you successful in reaching that end consumer, whoever that end consumer might be. So we can assemble the tools that one needs to deliver that success uh, an interesting proof point for us over the last 12 year, 12 months has been with the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, that the go government rolled out mm -hmm. in 2020 and uh, early part of this year. And Cross River was a top five lender by loan count across the country. In the first round, I believe we were number three or four, even more than a bank like Wells Fargo. So when you think about it, here's a, a small institution in that doesn't have any direct consumer contact or small business contact, but has assembled the infrastructure to power some of the biggest names in the business. And when we use that horsepower to power our PPP program along with you know, other, um, other partners like Bluevine and Cabbage and Intuit and some of the others, we managed to get to right at the top and challenge some of the biggest names in financial services globally in delivering a solution that helped the economy and helped save you know, millions and millions of, of businesses. So you know, long story short, I think um, we power some of the biggest logos in the business and we do that by scale and we do, do that by having an extremely robust offering, you know, a firm, Coinbase, Upstart, Upgrade, Plaid, Stripe, they're all clients and customers of, of Cross River. Yeah, you're definitely working with some of the some of the best brands in, in the space. Um, let's drill down on, on lending and payments, as you described. Um, how, how do you and Cross River view, I guess, the landscape and, and where we're headed uh, with lending and payments as a whole? Yeah, so lending and payments are the, the lifeblood of fintech. It's really where fintech is at the moment to, to a large extent. I think where fintech goes will continue to evolve over time and it'll become possibly less lending and, and payments focused. Uh, but today that's where the action is, so to speak. I would say today we're probably more focused, generally as an industry, uh, more focused on payments than we are with lending. Uh, lending was, in my view, the first wave of fintech. You, you had those pioneers like Green Sky and Lending Club and, and Prosper and Marlette and others, you know, take the delivery of consumer lending solutions and of course a firm, take the, the delivery of that solution to a different level and caused a dramatic shift in consumer behavior as a result of that evolution. So the interesting question of, you know, if you look at what's happened in lending, is it that consumers were not satisfied with the existing solution, which is your credit card, and they were looking for something different? Or was it that FinTech engendered a change in behavior with buy now, pay later and what a firm has done? Mm. Um, so which one came first, which drove which is, is the question. I think for us, we wanna be at the forefront of either recognizing that change in behavior or helping shape that change in behavior. I think a firm to a large extent helps shape that change in behavior. It made people think about spot purchases, about what do you wanna carry credit for? 
and what should you not carry credit for? How do you reorganize the way you approach your financial decisions? How do you compartmentalize your money decisions and your bu your buying decisions? So that's that's changing, you know, with each generation coming into the economy and buying in a different way and saving in a different way and interacting with their service providers in a different way. That's going to continue to evolve. And so we've seen that starting to take place in lending with the advent of buy now, pay later. I think that we're still at an early innings. I think that there's a lot more to come. Uh, income smoothing, for example, or rather smoothing of your payments based on your income is a trend that at the moment is only now emerging. So you see providers offering your paycheck three days early. Why three days? Why not 14 if you get paid twice a month, right? So we still got another 11 days to go to fix that problem. So that's something we think is, is coming. So, and, you know, that again is going to have a dramatic shift in the way consumers operate because then the expectation we believe five years from now will be my financial partners understand my financial situation and are going to deliver me a solution that takes care of that for me as opposed to us having to think about it and arrange that in our heads. So I think that's another revolution to come. With payments, payments is so interesting because it's so vast from both a consumer standpoint as well as from a business standpoint. Vertical integrations of, of payments is, is something that we're seeing happen across the board. Um, cross-border, seamless cross-border movement should be taken for granted. Why do we pay some of the biggest banks a huge bid ask spread when we're moving to thinly traded currencies, for example? So payments is going to is going to continue to see multiple dimensions of development. Um, we are again an infrastructure provider, and we're fortunate in that we've developed our own core banking software that's entirely real time. It's homegrown. It has no dependencies. And so we can make real-time payments decisions by being in the, in the flow of information and knowing whether the money exists or doesn't exist. So we developed a solution for Coinbase uh, of this nature a few years ago, and you know, we know it's really helped them and, and, and others. So payments, I think, a lot more to come on the payment side. Um, lending has already started evolving, and we think that, that there's much more when it comes to Data services, how you control your data is, of course, obviously already being tended to thanks to the regulators. But what, what happens with that data, what your providers are uh, predicting will happen is, uh, is some of the next frontiers that we expect action on. I appreciate that. Um, over the past three days, we've heard from different types of infrastructure providers. Um, Karen, what do, you, what do you think of the roles of of a chartered financial institution in this sort of ev evolution that we're talking about. Um, and, and how do you fit in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your partners, your clients, or your competition, partners, both? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, uh, are you friends? Are you enemies? Everyone loves to ask. Frenemies. Uh, yeah. Frenemies, you know, <laughs> the compartmentalized uh, representations. I think that, you know, leaving Cross River aside, it, it depends on what the core motivations of the business are. So what is the institution? What are their goals? If you're some of the larger uh, financial institutions that are traditional banks, fintechs present a loss of the consumer relationship, mm -hmm. uh, a loss of a cross-selling opportunity, and an erosion of the asset base. So today, thanks to the Fed and uh, helicoptering of money across the economy, we now kind of have an expectation that if you've got any kind of liquidity crunch or any kind of macroeconomic, uh, not just a shock, but any kind of tightening, that there's an expectation that, that the government and the Fed is going to come in with, with significant amounts of easing. I mean, to, a man, to many people in the fintech space, quantitative uh, easing and loose monetary policies are a fact of life. They've been that way since, uh, since 2008. So the amount of money that's in the financial system and the amount of liquidity that's been created is enormous. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. 
those trillions and trillions of dollars are chasing the same assets. Where do those assets come from? Either you lend more, you take out more debt, asset values go up. So, you know, that in, in, in itself creates uh, more to spend on. But that chasing of assets has resulted in prices coming down and returns coming down. So that means that banks are now the loss of a client or cross sell to, to someone else is more painful today to a traditional financial institution than it was in the past. And that's just exacerbating. Now, what fintech is doing in some senses is interesting, right? So it's on the lending side, at least, it's taking some share away from banks. But it's also underwriting in other segments of the population more effectively than banks could because the banks were hamstrung by what the regulator, regulators would allow them to do or what their models told them. Models are now more sophisticated. Some of the biggest fintechs we have in the US have more consumers than some of the biggest banks. Can you imagine the amount of data that someone like an firm has, for example, or that a Coinbase has? People who've made millions and millions of loans, they've made more loans in three years than some regional banks make in a decade. And so that tells you a lot about the customer. So you can underwrite better, you can provide a better solution, and then you could probably sell that asset back to the bank. So going back to the frenemies, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. I think it really just depends on the orientation of the business. Um, it's the same story in, in small business lending and middle market lending. I think mm -hmm. that's where the disruption still has some room to run. Um, so, you know, remains to be seen, but, you know, there's certainly going to be a colliding of worlds. There's certainly going to be, to some extent, collaboration and cooperation. Marcus, I think, is at an interesting standpoint where, you know, where they are a traditional financial institution that's semi-perceived as a fintech, very much competing with a fintech, partnering with some of the best names in technology like Apple. Um, so, yeah, it, it's certainly going to be, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I agree with you totally. Um, we do have a question from the audience I'd like to interject here, Karan. Yeah. Um, it's from Joshua. Uh, do you see small digital banks? Well, we've had a few of them here at this conference with very niche audiences continuing to increase as a trend, or do you think that curve eventually flattens out? Um, sounds like you have good insight into sort of this, this move. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, embedded finance is, is talked about all the time. Um, delivering financial solutions is talked about all the time. The barriers to entry to creating your own little neobank stack is uh, have come down dramatically. Cross River can build you a neobank in three months, uh, soup to nuts. And that can include plastic, it can include lending, it can include whatever you want. It can be full stack offering. So then the question becomes, how captive is your consumer and are they going to transact with you across the spectrum such that you're going to recover your investment and continue to generate shareholder value? Or is somebody going to see that as being a valuable interaction and then purchase you? And that's how you generate your, your shareholder value. So I think it ties back to what that behavior question is. Are your consumers going to change their behavior in such a meaningful way that they're going to deviate from what they've been doing in the past and, and fit the model of behavior that you are you are trying to create. So jury's out on that one. I think that to a large extent, many of these small uh, niche banks will fail because being a bank is extremely hard. And that's where part of what we do is we take some of the pain away from banking. We believe that Banking actually hasn't been disrupted. Bank Disruption in banking is not about mobile banking. Disruption in banking is about taking all the services that you could have in a traditional bank and cutting them up into small little pieces and then offering each piece individually. And what we do is we give you the regulatory wrapper and we give you the rails to be able to deliver each individual piece. Why deliver the whole section of pipe when you only need a one foot section? Mm -hmm. So the question for some of the smaller niche players is, what's your niche? What's your target market? How, what's your revenue model? 
What's your oversight mechanism? And do you have, are you going to build that oversight mechanism and deal with the FDIC yourself, which is going to cost you millions of dollars a year? Or are you going to work with us so that we can use our scale? We have more than 75 clients. We can use that scale and we only have to deal with the FDIC once. So I think we're at that forefront of answering that question, but I don't know if I have that answer yet. Okay. No, no crystal ball. No crystal ball. Um, so we have time for one last question. And this is an incredibly uh, interesting conversation. Um, I want to, you mentioned crypto a, a few times in, in, in your, in your answers. Um, what role does cryptocurrency have in the, in the future of banking? And, and what are, maybe you give some examples with clients, with non-clients, what are some institutions doing today to, uh, to really integrate it into the regular system? Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's a question we're all asking. It's a question that all the big banks are asking. It's a, it's a question of a lot of small banks and small financial institutions want to know how they can get involved in that. And so it's um, there's certainly some areas in which crypto is a natural fit. Why do I have to wait three days for settlement? If crypto lets me do it in three seconds, isn't that a better outcome? So better, faster, cheaper is a mantra that we live by. And in mm-hmm. many ways, crypto is better, faster, cheaper. In other ways, it's not. You know, mining is inefficient, um, but there are other ways of ledgering and there are other ways of settlement mechanisms that I think crypto has a role to play. I think it can upend some of the traditional settlement mechanisms. Um, It naturally has a cross-border element that I think is very, very powerful. Going back to what I mentioned earlier about paying the big banks, a big bid ask spread. What if I need to move my... um, dollars to Bangladeshi Taka. How many legs does that transaction take? Does it go via London? Why? Mm -hmm. So crypto is a natural solution to some of those things. You know, you got um, providers that are already doing that for cross-border movements in Africa. So I think that for certain spot cases, it's very powerful. The power of blockchain is also powerful, but needs to be done in the right way. Otherwise, you know, it could be a boiling the ocean type problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of future there. Um, so so obviously uh, cross border is as you mentioned is one use case. Um, we've had a few companies talk about DeFi. Um, how close are we are to actually seeing that sort of become more mainstream? Yeah, I think I think we're two or three years away at least. Um, the interesting thing about DeFi is. A lot of the attraction in DeFi is coming because of the, the high yields, right? Mm-hmm. But we're, we're an economy that's a wash in liquidity. When this becomes more and more mainstream, the volatility goes down and the liquidity premiums go down. And then DeFi starts to become less interesting. Thank you. I've been saying that to everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's the rails that it creates. Mm-hmm. If DeFi creates new rails in which every single transaction can get pieced out into millions and millions of little bits, that to me is extremely interesting. Amazing, Karin, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate you and Cross River joining us at the Big Bang Theory Conference this year. Thank you. Look forward to the next one, hopefully it's in person.